Banking House Urban Affairs Committee will come to order. I'm excited to hear today what public transit means to people in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, in Greenville, South Carolina, and in Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you to the witnesses for being here. For that, I want to say a few words about the people in East Palestine, Ohio, in the aftermath of the Silicon Valley bank collapse. They both have one thing in common. Companies followed the Wall Street business model, obsessed with short-term profits at the expense of everything and everyone else. They were aided and abetted by corporate lobbyists and the politicians here who do their bidding, weakening rules meant to protect the people whom we serve. And now working people in Ohio and around the country pay the price. As the nation knows, East Palestine is a tight-knit town in Columbiana County near the Ohio River near the Pennsylvania border, which once made 80% of all the ceramics in this country. Before those jobs, like so many in my hometown of Mansfield and others moved overseas, because companies pay less overseas. This town, neighboring communities in Beaver County, Pennsylvania, Senator Fetterman, a member of this committee, his the state he represents, are the kinds of places too often forgotten or exploited by corporate America. Now these Ohioans are worried about whether their water is safe to drink, whether the air is safe to breathe, whether their beef cattle can now sell a side of beef, whether their kids will get sick and of interest to this committee, what happens to the value of their homes all because of a train derailment caused by a corporate culture of cutting corners and cutting safety rules. Norfolk Southern chose to invest much of its massive profits in making its executives and shareholders wealthier at the expense of Ohio communities along its rail tracks like East Palestine, Steubenville where there was a derailment, Sandusky where there's a derailment, Springfield 200 cars derailed since East Palestine. The company followed the Wall Street business model, boost profits and its stock price by eliminating more than a third, 38% of its workers over 10 years, then spent $3.4 billion in stock buybacks and were going to do more when this accident happened instead of investing in its workers and investing in safety. Senator Vance and I have come together to introduce our Railway Safety Act to make trains safer to, as they go through communities like East Palestine. We're working with the Commerce Committee to move that legislation forward quickly. For decades, the railroads have lobbied to undermine safety rules. They're fighting basic requirements. Basic requirements like having two drivers, two engineers, two pilots, if you will, on these trains. Two and a half mile long trains, 200 cars. The railroads want only one human being on that train driving it. Think of that. The railroads think that a train more than two miles long needs only one crew member. We know what it's about. Cut costs to boost profits, something you can't do in your jobs. The, community, in, in the communities along their routes be damned. It's the same story with Silicon Valley Bank, and we will have hearings about that soon. For as long as we've had big banks, they've had too much power in this town. Think of the two of the most powerful lobbyists in this town for 100 years, the banks and the railroads. It's how we got the financial crisis of 08 that, walked, that wiped out workers' savings and permanently set back an entire generation of young Americans. Of course, Wall Street didn't change its ways. Wall Street banks spent the ensuing years lobbying to roll back safeguards we passed in the wake of that crisis. Now, the now defunct Silicon Valley Bank spends hundreds of thousands of dollars pushing for exemptions for banks like this. Their CEO, who came to testify, who now is I guess unemployed, sort of, said they shouldn't be subject to strong guardrails because of, quote, the low risk profile of our activities and business model. Low risk profile, his words. We know what that really, really wanted to do, maximize, maximize profits, risk be damned. Now look what's happened. The paychecks of thousands of Ohioans, I talked to, to, to the leaders of these companies were at stake last weekend because of these Silicon Valley's executives' arrogance, arrogance and incompetence. When we let when we let corporations run the economy, workers and their families always pay, whether they're, uh, in the, 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 whether they're in Cleveland, whether they're in Maryland, whether they're in South Carolina. They always pay, whether it's for the greed of Norfolk Southern or Silicon Valley Bank or Big Pharma or Big Oil. Pretty simple question at stake in everything we do in these jobs. Whose side are you on? Do you stand with corporate lobbyists or do you stand with communities like East Palestine? Do you stand with Silicon Valley executives and venture capitalists or do you stand with small business? Do you stand with Wall Street or you stand, do you stand with workers? Same fight over and over and over again. As this committee looks at how to respond to this latest in the long line of financial industry, incompetence and greed, I hope my colleagues will put partisanship aside as Senator Vance and I are doing on rail safety 
to stand with the people we serve. Turning to transit, our committee worked on a bipartisan basis to include, as the three of you know, the biggest investment in transit ever in the bipartisan infrastructure law. Better transit means new, means new zero emissions and low emission buses. I've talked to the CEO of the, the, the Cleveland, the RTA in Cleveland, and she is so on top of that, and it really matters. It means faster, safer service. More people can get to the doctor, to the grocery store, to work, to church. It means more opportunity for all the communities that have been ignored and exploited for too long, whether it's a black community or a brown community, whether it's small towns or rural areas, all of the above. I've worked with Senator Rounds a lot. He understands rural transit, perhaps anybody, better than anybody on the, the committee with the work he does with Senator Smith of uh, both have major rural areas in their upper Midwest states. I'm looking forward to working with Ran Ranking Member Scott on transit issues. Today we have witnesses today from both of our home states. We'll hear how the Cleveland RTA is improving their bus and rail service for riders and in, in replacing decades old rail cars. The RTA has been planning their investments in new rail cars for years. Because of work we did on the infrastructure law, they're finally going to be able to get better cars and newer, cleaner buses. And Ms. Minor, thank you for nodding as I'm saying that. So Cleveland's also home to the, to the health line on Euclid Avenue, one of the best bus rapid transit corridors in the country and they're joining other transit agencies in Ohio to expand their faster service. I, I, I live in the city of Cleveland. I see the kind of service they're giving. Ms. Birdsong Terry is deeply committed to attracting new workers to the transit industry. 2,000 employees she has, so that's a club estimate number, to enter ensuring these workers have the training they need. I'm also interested to hear how GreenLink will grow in the years ahead to meet the mobility needs of Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, thank you for being here. And we're lucky to have the president of the Amalgamated Transit Unions, Unions Baltimore Local, Mr. McMillan, has been an important partner to the committee in making transit safer for riders and workers. Mr. McMillan, thank you for how you honor the dignity of work and fight for your workers. We have an opportunity in this Congress to listen to local voices. Uh, Senator Scott and I like to do that to learn how to help more Americans enjoy high quality transit service. We begin that work today. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I start, my comments on, on Silicon Valley Bank and the failures there. I'd like to acknowledge the fact that today I get to share this hearing with Mr. Keel from my home state of South Carolina. We look forward to hearing the testimony from all three witnesses. But Mr. McMillian, I, I realized that just last night at midnight, the issue of public safety and transit safety came home. One of your bus operators was stabbed twice twice last night. I'm sure you were up through the night focusing on the issues that care, you care most about, the safety of your operators. So sorry to hear about the devastating news. That seems to be repeated too many times in too many places around this country. The safety of our transit system is a major question and a major failure that we need to address. Thank you for being here this morning, because I cannot imagine how difficult it is to show up here when your thoughts and your heart has to be with your operators. But more importantly, I can't think of a better time to be here to talk about the issues that have such a drastic and strong impact than to talk about it today at the banking hearing. So thank you for being a part of this committee this morning. Thank you for participating. And certainly our prayers and our thoughts are with your operators. As it relates to the failure of the Silicon Valley Bank, there's no question that that failure should be seen through the three prisms. One is the failure of the bank execs and the board. They were betting on interest rates going down when there was a clear sign from the Fed that interest rates were going up. Not one time, not two times, not four times, not six times, but eight increases. And the bank management and the board sat there idly by doing nothing. That is a travesty and has had a devastating impact on our financial systems. The good news is our financial system remains strong, it is well capitalized, and frankly, the rules that have been in place, the laws that have been passed, 
are in fact doing its job. The challenge, of course, is when regulators refuse to do their jobs and enforce the laws. The law is not the problem. If you pass more laws and more regulators don't do their jobs, what good is the law? We've seen this way too often. The regulators were literally, or figuratively, asleep, asleep at the wheel. Uh, we see that playing out throughout the SVB failure, signature failure, and other bank failures. We know that the San Francisco Fed failed twice. Obvious issues of liquidity rising. J.P. Morgan in November of last year indicated that without any question, the situation at the Silicon Valley Bank was dangerous. A financial blogger in December saw what the regulators refused to see, which was the dire situation, not developing, already in place, already in place at SVB. And yet our regulators did absolutely, positively nothing. When we had an opportunity to ask about the last time an examination happened at the bank, our regulators could not answer the question. We look at the incredible explosion of inflation devastating our nation in every single state. And what we see is, as inflation rises really fast to a 40-year high, the Fed's responsibility is to try to tame the inflationary effects in our economy. What does that look like? It looks like, bless you, interest rates going up very quickly, so fast that the securities portfolio at SVB was in the wrong position and the management decided to do nothing. A failure at the bank, a failure with the regulators, and without any question, a failure at the top, which is the President of the United States that created an inflationary effect that we haven't seen. So we, it led to the fastest increase in interest rates we've seen in more than three decades. That combination is devastating to American families, but more importantly, here, the, here this is the part that I want to make sure we don't miss. The average person in our country has a bank balance of around $5,000. And those folks, because of the actions of the regulators and this administration, will now be bailing out those who had balances of $5 million. Some will say it's not a bailout, it's not a bailout, it's not tax dollars. Well, According to the law, the special assessment fee that will be imposed upon banks could be as high as $220 billion. Banks don't print money. The Fed prints money, but banks do not print money. So who bears the burden of that special assessment, whatever it turns out to be? It's everyday account holders who have to pay higher interest rates and or pay higher fees associated with the policies or the products they purchase at these banks. And this bank was an anomaly, without any question. But when the regulators are asleep and the inflation is a 40-year high and the Fed goes to work, bad things happen to everyday Americans. So let's not think about this simply from the perspective of the bank, which they needed to be closed. Action needed to happen. But the question is, is the action of this government imperiling more Americans with very few dollars in their accounts, comparatively speaking, to the venture capitalists that this administration has decided to insulate? To our hearing today. Maybe some of you don't realize this, but I served on county council a number of years ago. I spent 13 and a half years in local government. It was the most remarkable experience one might ever have. It gave me an opportunity not only to be the chairman of the county and to prepare for natural disasters like hurricanes, but it also 
gave me an opportunity to serve on the board of directors of CARTA, which is the Charleston Association of Transportation in the area of Charleston, South Carolina. So I spent a number of ye years on and off the board. And one of the things I realized is that mass transportation is a local issue, fundamentally a local issue. And local issues need local solutions. I look forward to having a conversation about how we can be helpful in this conversation, but I want us to not lose the point that mass transit is very different in each one of our states, very different in each one of our communities, even in our states. Charleston needs are very different than Greenville needs, so they may have some similarities. But the one thing that none of us have, is, is, as far as I can tell, please raise your hand if you have a lot of extra money hanging around somewhere on a balance sheet with nothing to do with it. Giving extra priorities, whether it's ESG, whether it's electric vehicles, without actually the resources to deliver on the mandates is, is irresponsible. Our government, the federal government, continues to provide uh, more mandates more challenges and no, act no actual answers or actionable items to change the trajectory of the local transit, except for to cost more money. It, the, the, right, the right to choose the right ridership, the right routes, is a difficult one in and of itself. Challenging to make sure that the passengers are on the, on the vehicles at the best times, the, the peak times, and, and not the buses and or the trains running empty, real challenges that you have. Uh, the challenges of managing a local transportation system are immense. Uh, what you don't need are more unanswered questions. You don't need those. You need more solutions, and we need to have more trust and confidence in the way that you manage your systems. I look forward to hearing your testimony. I look forward to having a conversation about some of the solutions that you all would want us to take into consideration. I look forward to having a conversation about safety that is a par of paramount importance that we spend too little time talking about it. We, we see it on the news, but we don't personalize the issues. These are everyday Americans trying to make a living and, and provide a much needed source of transportation. And yet too often they feel unsafe, not just a riders, but the operators. And so I look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ranking Member Scott. I'll introduce today's witnesses. Um, Ms. Indira Bon Birdsong Terry serves as CEO and General Manager of the Greater Cleveland RTA, Regional Transit Authority. She joined RTA um, three and a half years ago and brings more than 15 years experience working in the public transit industry. She served as the COO of WeGo Public Transit in Nashville. At RTA, Ms. Birdsong Terry oversees 2,000 employees, the largest transit system by far in Ohio, almost twice uh, Columbus or Cincinnati. She's provided exceptional leadership to RTA by advancing innovative solutions to improve service and coverage for Cleveland area riders. She continues to expand RTA's role in the economic development in the region. Uh, not clear what I heard a minute ago, but she will, among other things, talk about the massive federal investment uh, in infrastructure in capital and what it means to riders in greater Cleveland. Um, Mr. James Keel serves as Greenlink's public transportation director, uh, the city of Greenville, South Carolina's public transportation department. He concurrently serves as the executive director uh, for GTA, I guess I can call it that, um, which provides public transit services throughout Greenville County. He began his public transit career as a bus operator for East Carolina University. Uh, transit in Greenville, and he's managed a charter services unit before joining GreenLink. Mr. Matt Michael McMillan is president of the Amalgamated Transit Union's Local 1300 in Baltimore, and I join the ranking member in, in expressing my uh, my sympathies and challenges of that the ranking member did about your, your driver. Um, Local 1300 represents more than 2,200 active frontline operations and maintenance workers of the Maryland Transit Administration. He served as a bus operator for MTA for a decade and a half before becoming a subway operator, which he did for another seven years. Always active in the union, Mr. McMillan was elected as president of Local 1300 four years ago, is now uh, serving in his second term. Thank you for all you do to promote the dignity of work. Ms. Birdsong Terry, uh, you're welcome recognized. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my, as mentioned, thank you so much, uh, Chairman Brown, and of course, Ranking Member Scott, in addition to the members that are here, Mrs. Britt, 
it's my pleasure to be able to serve uh, testimony this morning to be able to talk about the items that were mentioned by both of you regarding public transit and the state of the future for that particular industry in this country. Uh, GCRTA is a legacy multimodal transit system providing bus, heavy rail, light rail, bus rapid transit, which is our moniker, as well as paratransit, servicing approximately 100,000 customers daily. Our agency's annual operating budget stands around $324 million, and our annual capital budget varies between $100 and $120 million per year. As mentioned, we're very proud of the fact that we are the largest uh, public transit agency in Ohio, and we do also uh, provide passenger rail services to those residents of our region, and we are in a state of good repair, uh, which I'll go into in a little bit here. We do have a new mission statement, and I wanted to be able to explain that a little bit because it's very simple. Uh, we really transitioned from a technical mission statement. Everyone wants our service to be clean, on time, friendly, all of those basic tenets of public transit, but we've got to be able to elevate our industry beyond just the norm. And to do that, we really thought about what makes us come to work every day. And we landed on connecting the community. It sounds very simple and basic, to your ear when you first hear it, but when you really deep dive into what that means, it allows us to support the diverse interests of greater Cleveland. Understanding that public transportation is the connective tissue between neighborhoods and citizens, it's no surprise that the most frequent trips taken on GCRTA, otherwise known as RTA, are comprised to journeys to work, 60%, school, 23%, and roughly 9% in the balance to healthcare opportunities. And that really gets to supporting the mental health items that are mentioned by the unfortunate incident in Baltimore last night. Understanding that we are a legacy public transportation system, RTA faces a tremendous hurdle and we are not alone. Keeping up with our aging infrastructure, state of good repair needs is paramount. This most basic need is not only a facet of our daily operations at the garage level, but it's a customer experience every day. We understand that we have to be clean, safe, and flexible, but it's being be more difficult on a daily basis as our infrastructure ages with time. So enter in the passage of the IIJA, or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This particular grant funding availability is instrumental in our ability to manage the reasonable expectations. And I say reasonable because it is reasonable. And those are the tenants of the customers we have. They want to have something clean. They want to have public transit that's accessible. They want to feel safe. It is our duty, as mentioned by Ranking Member Scott, as well as Chairman Brown, that we have to be able to show up and show up every day and provide those basic tenants of service to those that need it most. And those are the on the backs of the men and women who serve our country, and we particularly saw the essence of that during the pandemic. We had to be able to get them to work so that the rest of us could survive. Simply put, the historic increases in federal transit funding are essential and are making a huge impact in Greater Cleveland. We thank you for the investment of RTA and the residents we serve. The IIJA increased RTA's annual formula funds by 30% over the next five years. We are ready to be able to act. This includes work on our, water, our waterfront line bridge that serves downtown, many residential and entertainment districts, as well as our vehicle replacement program for our rail system. Our rail cars average between 38 and 41 years of age. This is way beyond the acceptable rate of use for their life. They typically age out for rail cars around 35 years. We currently have raised $213 million towards overall program and estimated uh, $393 million for the entire program and hope to be able to bridge the gap. We also have a lot of different programs going on that I'll elaborate on during the Q&A if possible for low no emission and also the ADA accessibility program. Public safety is at Paramount where we have partnered with our local unions on the PTAS program which we will talk about in addition to a civilian oversight board, transit ambassador program, and a plethora of other mental health programs. We also continue to talk about workforce and how we can become a force in the economic driver of Cleveland. 
with that, I appreciate the time today and I look forward to being able to answer questions on the many programs of the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Keel, welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Brown and Ranking Member Scott for this opportunity today to talk about Greenville, South Carolina and the Greenville Transit Authority. If you haven't heard of Greenville, we're located in between Charlotte, North Carolina and Atlanta, Georgia. And what we're really known for is our downtown. We have a beautifully curated downtown um, and just opened a new 60 acre park. So green space is something that we care a lot about. We were actually voted one of the 10 best cities to buy a home in just this year, and our economy is booming. Uh, Greenville County currently has about 500,000 residents, and we're expected to expand by about 220,000 by 2040. So people are moving to South Carolina. Last year, South Carolina was the third fastest growing state in the country. But our transit system is, is smaller. We have about 12 fixed routes, provide 18 hours of service a day on the weekday and 10 hours on Saturday, covering 94 square miles. During the peak of the pandemic, our ridership decreased 44%, uh, which is small in comparison to that of some agencies. And in a radical move, our board decided to actually increase service, adding four more hours of service per day, really to help out those shift workers. Our essential workers in South Carolina are very important to us. Last year in 2022, we saw a ridership increase of 17% on fixed route and our paratransit service increased 54%. South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce actually looked at really what are the barriers to transportation in South Carolina and it's actually public transit is one of the top five issues that's currently facing our state. We kind of consider ourselves ahead of the curve on that though because in 2018 we did a robust transit development plan looking at how we need to grow to make sure Greenville County doesn't get behind that curve. This includes later hours, increased frequencies, and 15 additional routes. And by the time hopefully all this is done by 2030, 73% of the jobs in Greenville County are going to be within one half mile walk of the routes that we have in place. Last week, a local group put together an economic impact study um, from a professor at the University of South Carolina and found that the investments of the TDP will actually increase economic activity in Greenville County between $670 million and $2 billion annually. That said, there are three major issues that we're kind of looking at as we move forward. One, GTA doesn't actually have a dedicated revenue stream. There's no penny or property tax uh, that is providing any kind of funding source for us. So it's the city and the county that are providing us budget subsidies every year. As a matter of fact, our operating budget is supposed to increase by 14% as we move into FY24, and this is largely due to a 12% increase in bus operator salaries that's being driven by inflation. So although there are monumental increases to 5307 funding, the majority of those funds are just going to be to deal with the inflationary issues that we're currently facing. There's also some new requirements in bill that we quite frankly don't care for. The zero emission fleet transition plan to be able to apply for low and no emission funding is a concern. Given the fact that we actually first adopted our first electric vehicles in 2018 and have another award and are having five more Proterra vehicles delivered, uh, hopefully early next year. The other major issue that I wanted to at least mention as far as Greenville is concerned is the pandemic was, was challenging, challenging for us and the number of individuals that we are experiencing right now that have some sort of mental illness or homelessness is at a record that we have not been prepared for and like most in the industry, need help understanding on the best way to deal with and move forward. That said, uh, of our fleet of 27 fixed route vehicles for battery electric, we intend to work towards having a fully um, alternative fueled feet, fleet of uh, electric and compressed natural gas. We have concerns about strictly being electric, mostly as it relates to the emergency preparedness that we value in South Carolina. We've got a new operations and maintenance facility that'll hopefully be online early next year. We actually have a raise grant right now that we have to hopefully add some hydrogen in or have the solar panels added in to where we can expand into hydrogen in the future. That being said, uh, we greatly support the increases to public transit funding and look forward to the questions in this hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Keel. I'll save the questions for later, but is your, are your bus drivers union or not? They are not? We are not union. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Mr. McMillan, welcome, glad you're here. Thank you, good morning, Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Ranking Member, and members, members of the committee. Thank you for the acknowledgement of um, the injured uh, assaulted operator and also for this opportunity. 
Um, I'd like to focus on three areas which the IIJ is already improving transit in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, funding, safety, and workforce development. As far as, funding, as far as funding goes, we have gaps in our transit system throughout Baltimore. For many MTA riders, there are no direct routes for service to get to good paying, reliable jobs. Sometimes, and for most of the Baltimore city residents, they don't own a car. And a lot of times their commute to the job to good paying jobs is over an hour. With the help from the IJA, we hope to finally build a red line to connect East and West Baltimore uh, by rail. This connection will help low income neighborhoods to good job centers in Baltimore. Secretary Buttigieg announced last summer that 26 million in IIJ funds will be used to upgrade our Penn Station in Baltimore, and we are certainly grateful for that. We also need more covered bus shelters at bus stops to comply with the ADA for our riding passengers. We have a tremendous need, capital needs, in Baltimore. Thanks to the work of this committee, Baltimore's annual formula funding under the IJ will exceed $200 million from now until 2026. This is a tremendous help to our transit system. We can and will do better. Ridership is starting to bounce back also after the pandemic because it has slowed down um, due to it. The funding from the IJA is going to help MTA build back better. When it comes to safety, we're grateful for Senator Van Hollen, the chief sponsor of the Transit Worker and Pedestrian Protection Act, and also the members of this committee who co-sponsored that legislation and fought to get it included into the infrastructure bill. You have saved countless of lives, countless of lives and we'll be saving a lot more with this funding. In full testimony, we will tell the stories of my friend, Marcus Parks, a bus operator who was shot over 10 times and killed while on the job. Also, a friend, Ms. Francine Merritt, a train station operator who was severely beaten in which she couldn't even remember the attack the next morning when she wound up in the hospital. And as you heard, um, another friend, uh, Mr. Keith Braswell, Bad 620, he's been hit with MTA for over 15 years. Attack last night, he was stabbed once under his arm and once in his buttocks by a disgruntled passenger. These things have to stop. It is a regular job, it is a regular day on the job for, our, for the transit industry. And it is a wonder why that we have a bus operator shortage now. It takes a special person to do the job of operating a, in a public transit system. The IJ sets up labor management safety committees with equal numbers on both sides to deal with assaults and safety issues facing US, the US transit industry. In Baltimore, we're working with our um, management as a partnership. We have developed 14 seats for our joint safety committee. We have seven for labor and seven for management, and we're doing good work in this area. Unfortunately, transit systems throughout the nations are pushing back on labor and requirements of this law. More than one third of the ATU bargaining units report that management has not established a joint safety committee. We will have transit agencies falsely claiming that they are not covered by the IAJ. Managers attempting to appoint union committee members themselves and claims that management's pre-existing safety committees are enough. Dozens of agencies have ignored the FTA's deadlines to form committees and update their safety plans. It is incredibly disappointing and puts lives at risk. The FTA is relying on the ATU to determine which agencies are not in compliance with this law, but it is a work in progress. Finally, our workforce development. We're going to see the changes in transit soon. The state of Maryland has passed a bill that changes most of its diesel vehicles to, and hybrid vehicles to zero emissions by the year 2030. ATU 40 fully supports this change, and we are grateful for Congress providing billions of dollars in the IIJ to make this happen. The issue is that only a handful of our members are currently skilled enough to do this work. So training is needed. We are thankful that this committee and the Biden administration has required 5% of the, of the low no funding to be used by transit systems to fund workforce development training, including registered apprenticeships and labor management training programs. This will help our current members and our future members to have the advanced technology to be able to work on these electric zero emission buses. It's a win-win for everybody. In conclusion, through the IJA, Congress has recognized that if we want to create the silent union jobs and attract people to, these, to the transit industry, we must also invest in the people that make the transit a critical part of the nation's economy. Change comes and it is hard for some people, but ATU stands ready to work with the Biden administration and this committee to make sure that the IJA gets carried out successfully. 
Thank you for this bill and the opportunity to testify. Mr. McMillan, thank you for your comments. Uh, start, uh, Ms. Birdsong, Terry. What, what will new bus rapid transit service on West 25th Street do for the neighborhoods along the route, and how is RTA supporting economic developments in other neighborhoods around Cleveland, like Slavic Village? My wife and I live about a mile from Slavic Village, so talk about that, if you would. Sure, I would be happy to. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Um, it's, it's amazing the amount of infrastructure that can happen and then the effects that it can provide on a positive note for the, the residents of Greater Cleveland. Uh, we currently have a BRT in place that's been around for about approximately 15 years. So BRT is not new to Cleveland, as you know. However, being able to duplicate that uh, through new projects and with the help of the IIJA is just something that we're really excited about, to be quite honest. Um, there are two particular projects that I want to highlight in response to your question, Chairman. Uh, the West 25th Corridor uh, Priority Project that we have, it's a BRT project uh, in collaboration on the, on the campus of Metro Health. Uh, Metro Health is a, uh, is a medical facility that really serves as a level one trauma center as well uh, for those type of incidents that we discussed earlier. And it also kind of goes right through the middle of a, a Latino community uh, along West 25th that really provides an opportunity for accessibility uh, when RTA has service there. Uh, making sure that we can provide opportunity for economics, work, health for those residents of that area um, is, uh, is tremendous. We also have opportunity, as you mentioned, through Slavic Village uh, to be able to serve that corridor. And these are lower income areas that are on the cusp of uh, kind of gentrification in a positive way. Um, being able to do that really serves the ability to become an economic driver in Cleveland. Uh, we're looking at uh, design work for the Metro Health and with the Slavic Village area, um, that particular award, we had a $432,000 grant uh, from the same TOD pilot grant program as before. And the goals are very similar between the two projects. Uh, we expect to be able to put those into effect within the next coming years. Um, again, this is just a really great opportunity to, to show that we have a economic prowess in uh, public transportation. And we're not just simply moving people. We're actually connecting them to opportunities that allow them to be able to contribute to the economic vitality of the region. Thank you. I would only amend your comments that Metro Health is a public hospital yes. of equal in quality to more renowned hospitals at University Hospital and Cleveland Clinic. So thank you for mentioning them. I, I'm happy our committee could authorize funding for rail car replacement. Well, let me, let me, let me back up a second and um, to, to ask you about that before. I, the, the committee, tell, tell the committee more about the current state of the rail, the RTA's rail car fleet. You said they, they are 38 to 42 years old, something like that, four decades old. Uh, talk for a moment about what, what that means and what replacement will do. Thank you, Chairman. I'd be happy to. Uh, you are correct. Our, our rail cars, and we have approximately 76 of them, uh, date back uh, approximately 40 years. They vary in range between 38 and 41 years of age. Um, as I mentioned previously, that is well beyond their useful life. Uh, and as you well know, we are in the throes of being able to make sure that we can solidify funding to replace all of our rail cars for heavy and light rail. We're actually looking at uh, what I would call a flex car to be able to uh, take advantage of, of training so that we can actually train up our, our mechanical staff uh, to make sure that they're at the cutting edge of technology. Uh, we're in the beginning stages of negotiation, or I'm sorry, in the middle stages of negotiation for a car builder, and with any luck, we'll be able to announce that publicly this spring. Uh, we currently are looking at a 393 million dollar price tag to replace all of those rail cars. So we know that transportation is not cheap by any means. Um, however, it does serve for multiple generations and that's what we're looking forward to. Just to give you a quick example of the inflation that we have to deal with, just last year we were looking at a price tag of 300 million. And so that's definitely increased over time. So the longer we wait, the more expensive it will be. And then also with a lot of the, uh, the rail incidents that have happened within recent times, that is uh, a, a byproduct of waiting too long. And so we want to make sure that in Greater Cleveland, we're able to take advantage of being proactive. And we have a task team uh, that we have put together for quite some time. And we actually put $10 million aside of, out of our own budget annually to make sure that we can bridge that gap. We have currently identified $213 million toward that. And our residents are really excited to be able to uh, feel safer on our system. We do everything that we can to make sure that we are providing that type of service. But to be quite honest with you, we hold in more trains than we would like. 
uh, because we have to make sure that they're safe before we put them out. Uh, so our ideal situation is a 60 car fleet to be able to uh, be in service and uh, serving our residents within the next three years. Thank you, and I, um, uh, I would point out, and thank you for what you're doing on investment, I would point out this committee before I was chair was just referred to as the Senate Banking Committee because it was way too much about Wall Street. Now it's um, focus in this committee is housing, and this focus on this committee is public transit, and that's that's why the investment, and I'm hopeful we do even more. So thank you. Mr. McMillan, let me shift to you, and um, I, I know I'm over a bit, and, and, and Ranking Member Scott can do the same thing. Please take um, your time, sir. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Senator Scott. Um, I, I um, Thanks for alerting the committee of, about transit agencies, some, some of their failure to establish their safety committees. We need these committees to function effectively. What more can FTA do to ensure safety committees are functioning? And as you answer the question, tell us what worked well at the MTA in Baltimore as the safety committee was founded, and, and especially your experience um, as a driver for more or less two, close to two decades. What new designs for operator compartments make them safer for pedestrians and riders and operators? So bring your personal experience into this answer, if you would. Okay, yeah. So first of all, it was the ATU who first brought it to the FTA's attention that uh, a lot of agencies uh, that were covered by the unions were not in compliance with the new um, the IIJA provision. Um, once they were alerted about it, then it was told by the FTA to our ATU International President, John Costas, that it's, they continue to have the ATU to give them the updates of who's out of compliance. Um, if the FTA could take on that responsibility to be able to ensure that there's a reporting agency within the um, transportation industries uh, to report back to the FTA about where they are with the IIJA um, or the Joint Safety Committees, uh, that would be a great help um, on their part. Also, too, in Baltimore, um, and once again, I have to give uh, accolades to Senator Chris Van Hollen because what he did, not only is authoring, authorizing the bill, uh, being author of the bill, he continued to have steady communications with the uh, labor leaders in Maryland to ask them, how's it going? Where are you at? Um, and just kept an input on it. Um, our ATU and the national president has also had the leadership of the, uh, from the unions to report back to him so that he could report to the FTA as to where we um, are. So when I was able to go back to the table, and I'm also a member committee of our Joint Safety Committee, so as soon as I tell the um, administrator of MTA that, oh, I just had an update with Senator Chris Van Hollen to give him this, they want to make sure that they were in compliance because they did not want to have a bad report. Also, too, when you were constantly, what we were reminding them of uh, what could be enforced, there's a provision in the IIJA to say that funding should be withheld. Those penalties need to be enforced for those who aren't in compliance. And I think if the FTA would enforce these regulations, it would help better with um, forming and getting these committees um, started. From the operator standpoint, being a frontline employee, uh, it's great to hear from the frontline employees. They know what's out there every day. It's not just done by paperwork or analysis that come in through data from just somebody who rides the bus just one day. The commonly occurring, occurring assaults, the, also the bus designs. Our ATU has also created what they call a study on a future bus. This has to do with the A-frames on the bus where there's bad vision sight, um, also with the mirrors that are put on buses to sort of, uh, it will give better pedestrian protection for those who are crossing the street who may be caught in the blind spots. Also, uh, when the pandemic came along, you had the filtration system. If a person was to cough and the particles get in the air, it would get into the ventilation system. That ventilation system came straight up to the bus operator's compartment. Um, there has been a uh, filtration system that's been recommended on the ATU's behalf to use also closed off compartment when it comes to protecting the operator from uh, not only diseases, but uh, also from assaults. A completely closed, closed off compartment as if you were the, um, in a cockpit of an airplane. Uh, we also have situations that protect pedestrians. Some of the suggestions that we have given to the administration was if a person can see themselves getting on a bus and they see their face through a camera, it's more likely that they'll think twice before they commit 
an assault on the operator or harm their fellow passenger on a bus because they know that they can be identified. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Uh, Senator Scott. Yes, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to reserve my four minutes and 51 seconds for the next hearing when we have Secretary Yellen here so I can have more time with her, sir. Um, statute of limitations, sir. I, I know the statute of limitations. <laughs> Hopefully it lasts at least two or three weeks. I appreciate that, sir. I learned that from the Yale Law School graduate that yes, went sir. to school with my, with my daughter. Well, I'm, I'm just so happy that you Ivy League folks can tell time, but I will say I'll take my four minutes and 51 seconds for the next hearing that we have with Secretary Yellen. Yeah, good point, sir. None of that counts against my time. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, let, let me go to you. Turn the clock on yet? May the Lord bless me indeed. Mr. McMillan. <laughs> Mr. McMillan, uh, you, you, said, you said a lot about uh, improving public safety as it relates to cameras and other ways to reduce crime, reduce violence by doing simple things that are happening, frankly, everywhere. Cameras are a, is a, can be a strong deterrent. One of the reasons why I've been encouraging and supporting body-worn cameras for our officers is I think that everyone goes on more safely when you have just a simple body-worn camera. And so from my perspective, cameras in mass transit just seems like common sense to me. Your description of the violence facing your colleagues every day in your testimony is certainly stirring. Would you say that your drivers would feel safer with more of the technology that you talked about, safer with, with, with more equipment around them? And what about the riders as well? Talk to me about that for about a minute before I have to move on to the next person. Yes, yeah, so with those added protections, our drivers will feel safer with the cameras, but also monitors to where that person could see themselves actually getting on a bus. Uh, the operator's compartment, that's their workstation. Yes. And if they, uh, I, was a, I was a bus operator and a train operator. I felt safer as a bus operator, I mean, excuse me, as a train operator, because I was completely closed in. I yes. had a locked door, and it was less um, dealing with uh, public interaction when they get on uh, disgruntled uh, because of the fare structure or whether it's because of being late for work because of the bus schedules, um, not being on time. So, yes, they would definitely feel safe. And also patrons, if they can actually know that, hey, the bus driver's not just paying attention to the road, but I see a camera that sees everyone else on this bus, too, um, and can see what's going on, they'll feel like they're being more protected as well. Thank you, sir. Mr. Keel, uh, thank you for, once again for being here with us this morning, and thank you for your work that you do for Greenville and for the entire state of South Carolina, which is why I think it's important to understand how your agency has navigated the challenges facing transit agencies. It is my understanding that while many transit agencies were rolling back services during the pandemic, your agency was doing the opposite and expanding services. Is that right? That's correct. Can you walk us through how your agency has navigated the pandemic and, and, and an expansion in the middle of one? I can. So I will say throughout the pandemic, I don't think South Carolina ever shut down, but we did slow down. Yes. And we, we certainly saw that. But the majority of, of our riders are essential workers, meaning that they didn't have the ability to work from home. And, and because of that, they had to get to work every day, um, whether it was going to the hospital or going to a restaurant to work or going to, you know, a, a manufacturing facility. You know, we, we had to keep moving. And, and throughout that process, uh, you know, being small does have some advantages. And, and one of those is being able to inherently know our people and what they need. And our planning process really began back in 2017 and 2018, had been prepared to scale up. And, and as a result of the pandemic and ridership not, not decreasing the way the national average was, it was a risk of, you know, let's move forward and add more service and make sure people can, can access that shift work and, and can ultimately stay on the bus. And, and throughout that process, we, we adapted as quickly as we could. You know, all of the COVID protocols that practically every other agency went through we took advantage of to keep our people healthy, to keep our riders healthy, and ultimately in the end, um, it has certainly paid off and our ridership has grown because of it. One, two more quick questions for you. And with the chairman's absence, I will not use any of my time that I've reserved for the next committee hearing. Um, I know you have some traditional diesel powered buses and some battery electric buses in your fleet and are looking at compressed natural gas buses for the future. As you are acquiring new vehicles, 
What goes into your decision-making process when deciding what kind of bus you need? Upfront capital cost, maintenance costs over the life of your bus, what else? So that, those are, are obviously two big ones. Yes. We obviously care a lot about the environment and want to make sure that we're making green and conscious decisions around that. Yes. Um, that being said, we're also very aware of the weather in South Carolina. Um, hurricanes are a force to be reckoned with. We're also near Oconee Nuclear Facility. We're aware of their disaster response plans and, and how we may have to play a role in that one day. God forbid that ever happen. But having the ability to have a vehicle that we can fuel up and it's going to run for, you know, 18 or 20 hours is important. Um, battery electric vehicles really don't afford you that opportunity right now. Yes. Um, they're taking five, you know, sometimes less, sometimes more hours to charge. So there is a place for battery electric technology. You know, our board is certainly committed to going away from diesel, and that really is where the compression natural gas comes in. I don't think it's the end all be all. I think there are future opportunities with BE technology and even with hydrogen technology that are going to be better and cleaner. Um, so it, it's definitely going to be a, a staggered approach as we transition away from traditional hydrocarbons. Thank you. Just extending myself 30 seconds. I would say that one of the, the best decisions I made when I became a, a senator was to go undercover and ride through mass transportation systems in my state, specifically in the Charleston area. It gave me an opportunity uh, as uh, a, a new member of this body to appreciate the challenges, the opportunities, the wait. Uh, so many folks wait 30 minutes to 90 minutes to get to a job for seven hours and have the same wait on the back end. Uh, and having a chance to talk to passengers real time about what they're doing and why they're doing it, whether it's going to babysit grandkids or trying to get to work or trying to go to school. One of the best experiences I would encourage all of us to do in public services, make sure that we take the time to appreciate the experience that we spend so much time talking about. I think that is something that we all benefit from and we make better decisions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, it's hard to imagine that you went undercover so well known, so uh, in any event. Yes, sir, it's, it's, I better not eat up all your time. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you all for joining us. My colleagues here have heard me talk various times about the Gateway Program. Uh, it is a, a gateway aims to modernize the rail infrastructure uh, connecting New Jersey to New York Penn Station. It's a critical stretch of track that carries over 200,000 daily Amtrak and New Jersey transit passenger trips on approximately 450 trains. It's a linchpin of the entire Northeast Corridor going from Boston to Washington, a region that accounts for 20% of our national gross domestic product. So I'm pleased to see the Biden administration included 700 million for the Hudson River tunnels and the President's fiscal year 24 budget request. Hopeful that the project can move into the engineering phase of the Capital Investments Grants Program in the very near future. Uh, I raise this because I often talk about Gateway and the projects of this scale as having a national significance, because they do. But they also have major impacts on the ground in providing safe, reliable, and accessible service to communities. So Mr. McMillan, first of all, I, I, my thoughts and prayers are with your member who got stabbed uh, yesterday and just highlights uh, some of the discussion you were having before about that uh, this is a job that is critically important to move people, but is also can be risky. So uh, we, we are in solidarity with you there. Can you speak for a moment about what these types of major infrastructure projects and the federal investment that comes with them means to your members on the ground? Yes, well, for our members, it, it is. The um, funding that can come in uh, we don't have to, I don't have to, as a president, when I negotiate a contract, continue to have to go to them and tell them that, hey, the reason why the company is saying that your safety isn't important because they can't afford it. You know, we're tired of hearing that they have to cut service. When you cut service, it impacts the public. If you get an angry passenger to get on a bus, the first person that they see, that they want to take it out on a bus operator. So if this funding can come in so that these services don't have to be cut, uh, procurement when you're waiting on parts for uh, buses to be fixed so you don't have as many buses on the street, which also causes service cuts. The first person, again, that they see when a bus is late, 
they take it out on the bus operator. Mm-hmm. So our members will not have to have that interaction with um, the riding public and get into these altercations. So it'll be safe for them. And also for those who are riding, they'll get to these good paying jobs. They'll also be able to get there on time and keep their jobs. Thank you. Now, I've been an advocate of transit-oriented development because I've seen the transformative effects it can have on communities stretching back to the time that I was mayor. Uh, When properly planned and executed, uh, transit-oriented development can bring significant new investment to communities, providing new economic opportunities for families and business owners while ensuring affordable housing for residents and encouraging the use of public transit. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act expanded a Todd pilot program that I helped create several years ago. So, Ms. Birdsong Terry, I understand that the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority has received two of these grants in the past, one as recently as last November. Can you discuss how these investments have made uh, communities a much more vibrant place to live? Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate the question. Um, to your point, those TOD projects are imperative, especially in cities that are, have an urban core, as well as a rural impact. Um, if I can give a quick uh, statistic, I actually asked our deputy general manager of HR to pull a, a couple records before I came here to find out just what the impact was for those folks that lived in Cuyahoga County and then those outside of it. Uh, we have roughly about 2,100 employees, and 600 of those live outside of Cuyahoga County. And I mention that because those men and women are part of the force that create those TOD projects. So we're actually uh, investing in the generational wealth of the state well beyond the urban core. Um, When you get into those kind of projects, such as the West 25th BRT program and the Slavic Village, those are just a couple of programs. We have a 79th Street Opportunity Corridor uh, support where there's $1 billion that have been poured into that particular investment area. Um, These are a lot of uh, what would be traditionally called blighted areas by urban planners. I'm an urban planner by trade and then got into transportation and have worked every shift that probably is known to man. So understanding how this creates opportunities especially for the youth, is really important. Uh, Cleveland has a literacy rate that probably is around the 60 as far as uh, those individuals that need to be able to understand the importance of an education and being able to have access to that is vital. I'd also mention the paratransit community that we serve is really important as well. Our board chair, uh, Reverend Charles Lucas, is actually a paraplegic, has been that way for about 18 years, and he depends on our service to take him in and around the city and is quite frankly probably one of the most active board chairs I've ever experienced. And being able to provide that is is essential. So economic opportunity is something that really is part of the equation of these transit-oriented developments. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I'll submit a question to the record on uh, flexibility on operating funds and how it would uh, affect you. And the chairman has asked me to recognize Mr. Vance, Senator Vance. Actually, sir, it's uh, Senator Tillis is next. Okay. Well, then Senator Tillis. Thank you. Sorry, J.D. (laughs) Uh, thank you all for being here, Mr. Kilt. Uh, it's great to see you uh, from our great state. Uh, real quick question for you has to do with the Section 5307 Urbanized Area Funding form- Grant Funds. Uh, can you explain a little bit how those funds have been deployed and what, any, uh, what, if anything, we should do in terms of constraints and flexibility that need to be considered by Congress? I'll do my best. So... 5307 funding for GTA is lifeblood. If that was to disappear, our agency would no longer be serving anybody in in Greenville, and I'm fairly confident that that would be true for the majority of of South Carolina. So uh, we are a small agency with 12 routes, so we we qualify under the 100 bus rule, so we use uh, a lot of that funding, up to 75% of it actually for operating assistance. So meaning it is helping pay bus operator salaries and pay for fuel and other portion is used for preventative maintenance. So, you know, ultimately it, it is exceptionally important to us. I think, you know, the kind of one of the original purposes of that funding was to be heavily uh, capital focused on buying equipment, replacing equipment. Uh, but as to the nature of of really the economy for the past several decades, you know, opportunities were there in smaller agencies and smaller systems to use it for operating assistance. And, you know, now that it has been, um, it, it has become incredibly important to, to our system. Um, I think any feedback and uh, uh, to either, either or Miss India, maybe uh, your feedback specifically on it. Uh, I understand that we may be able to, aside from giving certainty on the funding stream, but that there may be some things that we need to rethink with respect to constraints. Anything to add to that? Uh, 
Uh, the flexibility between, thank you for the question, the flexibility between capital and operating is uh, definitely, I'd say, important, if not essential, to Greater Cleveland, uh, particularly in, the, in light of that we can't predict the sales tax and how that impacts our budget. Um, for example, 2008, when we had quite volatility uh, within the, the country, especially in the areas of real estate, uh, the sales tax took a dip. And if we were to be able to get into that situation again, uh, we would be in uh, very dire straits as far as being able to make good on the strategic plan that we have for a lot of our capital projects. And being able to kind of flex that funding back and forth allows us to stay above water and also make good on those uh, technology improvements that lead to the safety of those members that the union has. Uh, in Cleveland, I say, is about 85% unionized as far as uh, GCRTA is concerned. So we definitely are support. Mr. Kill, uh, South Carolina is a pretty red state. To what extent is the legislature being helpful uh, to uh, your priorities in Greenville? So I, I've been in, in South Carolina for seven years, and I will say there's been a bigger interest in workforce transportation as it relates to public transit probably in the past six months than there has been in my time before that. And it really is being driven by industry and manufacturers in our state who have begun asking or demanding more public transit to get their workers um, to work and be able to use that after hours to be able to move around where they don't have to rely on a car. As at the rate South Carolina is growing, congestion is becoming an issue and they're aware of them getting to work on time is becoming increasingly important. And that really is what has been driving more conversation as it relates to transit in South Carolina over the past couple of years. And, and that's just a broader question. I do not want to go over time after I jumped in front of Senator Vance. But I, uh, you know, I spent a lot, I was Speaker of the House down in North Carolina, spent a lot of time on mass transit in general, including light rail, and was generally supportive. Um, but that was 12 years ago. Um, when I started, and the world's kind of changed a little bit. So how are you all looking ahead with respect to new technologies, with respect to um, the employment patterns, transportation patterns that changed dramatically during COVID? Some of that's sticky. So what, what could you tell me about priorities that you may have had five years ago that are making you rethink exactly what role um, uh, transit's going to play in a, in a vastly different future scape as far as I'm concerned. And we can, uh, we'll, we'll start with Mr. Keel and then Miss India and then Mr. McMillan also. I, I want to offer my uh, condolences on the event with the bus driver um, as well. Sorry to hear about that. But Mr. Keel, if we could start with you. I, I want to make, I want to get a sense that we're really rethinking things and not implementing plans that may be 10 years old in this space. So we update our plans about every three years. So we, we, basically break it down and, and rethink it about every every three to five years. And what we really see is that we've actually seen an, an increase in opportunity as it relates to manufacturing jobs. The majority of our customers are not commuters, so we didn't see the dip that some systems saw. Um, and we, we do look at that. We look at our who our workforce is and at the same time who our employers are to make sure that we're having good conversations and good public involvement to make sure that as we're thinking about the future uh, that, that we understand what those travel patterns will look like. In addition to training technologies that we're look, looking at fair payment type um, and at the same time you know what what is the future of, of bus transportation as it relates to propulsion look like as well Miss India thank you very much I appreciate it Senator um, you're absolutely correct uh, we have to maintain flexibility in order to be able to be competitive within the market so some of the things that we're doing at GCRTA include our strategic plan was adopted within the pandemic time frame and that's a 10-year plan but we also have a simultaneous short range plan uh, I am, a, again, a planner by trade, so I'm very well aware that they can belong on the shelf and accumulate dust and nothing ever happens. So in order to make sure that does not occur in Cleveland, uh, we've got a short-term plan over the next uh, one to three years that basically takes us through task items. And we have what's called a net promoter score, if you're familiar with that through the private industry. It's almost like a Yelp review, how you're, you're uh, perceived by your peers and by your customers. We actually look at that on a quarterly basis, uh, monthly at a tactical level, to find out what the customer experience uh, is like, as well as the operational experience. And we have our goals set by that in order to align with the strategic plan. And that's the plans that include the uh, uh, compressed natural gas instead of diesel, the technology, and so 
on and so forth, as well as workforce. Uh, we also have completed what we call a next gen, and that's a revamp of our system. We've done that through the pandemic as well. We actually took an additional six months in order to recalibrate because we have a lot of that reverse commute pattern going on. People are going out into uh, our suburbs for workforce opportunities instead of the urban core. People are also working from home, so we have to be cognizant of that. Our ridership is probably about 65 to 70 percent on a good day, and that's 65 to 70 percent of pre-pandemic ridership. So what we've also done is rolled out a couple of uh, microtransit programs, which we're super excited about. That was probably one of the first things I heard uh, three and a half years ago when I stepped on Cleveland soil. And that was coming from those suburbs, Solon and those others, for example, that are about 30 minutes outside of the urban core. We're actually working with the union partnership to make sure that we operate almost like a private business in the beginning as a pilot program. And it's essentially a match program where those industries that need those workers are actually uh, putting their money where their mouth is. We're matching that to the tune of $600,000 to make sure we can have an 18-month pilot program and get those people to work so they don't, they don't have to have that two and a half or one and a half hour commute time on top of a 10 hour work day. So those are some of the things we're doing. We also are starting to look at fair capping, which actually gets into the equity part of how to make sure that accessibility is really truly equitable in Cleveland. Uh, those are just a few things that we're doing to make sure we can stay on top Thank of it. Thank you all, Mr. McMillan. I'm way over time now, so I defer back to the chair. Right. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for your, your testimony and for the work that you do. Uh, Mr. McMillan, good to see you uh, again. And uh, I was sorry to learn that you were at the hospital last night uh, visiting a fellow transit worker, an operator in the MTA that was stabbed. Is that right? Well, please give him our prayers and his family. That's prayers. Well, thank you, sir. Okay. And, and that does bring me to um, the issues that I want to raise because it was great to work with you uh, and others in the transit community to introduce the Transit Worker and Pedestrian Act to protect uh, transit worker safety. And I was really pleased that we were successful at including a lot of those provisions uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure modernization legislation. I want to talk a little bit about implementation of those safety provisions because I, I understand that uh, so far you've had a good experience in Baltimore working with the transit uh, folks uh, to, to implement that. Is that right? Yes, we do. But I also understand that it's uh, more of a mixed bag in other parts of the country. Uh, and I, I do want to just make clear uh, to all the transit agencies around the country that putting these safety plans in place is, is not voluntary. It's an obligation because of the kind of dangers that um, we just discussed that transit workers place. Can you talk about the, the experience elsewhere in the country and uh, what challenges you're facing with some local agencies? Yeah, some of the challenges we're facing right now is they feel like the law doesn't apply to them. And even though there are strict guidelines in there that points to it to show that they do, they're still just being non-compliant. They also still want to say, hey, um, this is my business. I make the rules. So those are the pushbacks that are coming and uh, that we uh, had to fight off. Um, and a, on a public sector, you know, we're dealing with the private and public sector. In the public sector in Maryland, um, once again, having a senator, <laughs> you know, who uh, was actually the author of the bill was a, a great help. Um, our ATU international president also um, was able to converse with the committee here and also be able to better interpret the language. And it, he passed it on to us, and we were able to also pass it on to the administration and work with us um, in those efforts. Um, but across the nation, we're still having those problems. You know, uh, those are the um, points that I brought out earlier uh, that we're facing with the challenges. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I understand um, from your, your testimony that Right now, FTA is relying on, on you, ATU, uh, to make determinations as to whether local transit agencies are in compliance. Uh, that should be the job of the FTA, right, with advice from you or input from you, but that should be something that, that they're responsible for, right? Yes, that should be something that the FTA is responsible for. Yeah. Well, we're going to push them because uh, the uneven... Uh, implementation of this around the country is, uh, is concerning, especially in light of the ongoing risks uh, to transit workers. Um, I just want to make a mention of the red line in Baltimore. Um, as we all know, this was a big priority of the Maryland delegation for a long time. 
Uh, our previous governor pulled the plug on it, uh, but we're working here, Senator Card and myself, members of the House, with the new governor, uh, Governor Moore, to implement that. Uh, what is your assessment of the impact that would have on, on Baltimore City in terms of the economy? Um, and what impact would it have on transit workers? Oh, this would be uh, have a tremendous impact, especially in Baltimore and in Maryland. We're East Coast. Um, we're right down the East Coast. Uh, the governor just announced that he want all of vehicles in Maryland, you know, the next 20 years to be electric. Uh, we also know that in Maryland, you know, the jobs that will be created for offshore wind, uh, dealing with uh, going green, the transportation, these will be labor jobs. Uh, jobs to where it shouldn't just be constricted to where those who live in the eastern part of Baltimore will be able to get to these jobs. But that east-west, that west to east corridor with the red line, it will be able to let the um, companies know that we have employers who are outside the living area will be able to get there and make that connection in a timely fashion and be able to get to all those jobs that will be created in a place called like Trade Point Atlantic who will have a lot to do with the electrification, offshore welding, and um, offshore wind, and other um, areas with um, building a company back in Maryland. Well, I appreciate uh, that. And the, you know, we introduced uh, work together on the Workforce um, uh, Transit, Transit, National Transit Workforce Act as well. And uh, I was pleased to see the FDA stand up the, the training center, but uh, we need to make sure we provide it with the resources needed. I mean, is, is workforce training as we move toward more electric, electrification in, in the cars um, going to be important? Uh, it definitely will, not only in the cars, but in the buses as well. Uh, the public will feel safer knowing that, that the MTA has skilled workers who have been trained right down the property on the vehicles that the operators are actually driving to know that they are safe when they put them out there. Uh, we will not have to be waiting for... Um, to be sending the workers off to California, uh, you know, to come back and then do training. Uh, we would like to have this funding could allow for us to have on-site training facilities on a property uh, for these electric buses. Also, what's incorporated in these bills is to make sure that those workers who are there who are diesel workers, they will not be left behind. They will be also able to get the skill set and the training that's needed, um, our members, to be able to work on these buses um, efficiently and effectively. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Senator Scott. Vance. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator Scott. <clears throat> and uh, Mr. McMillan, let me let me start by adding my, my voice to the condolences for what happened to your driver. We're certainly thinking about, about him and praying for him and, and uh, hope, hope everything turns out okay. I also just want to say that, you know, I, I know that, um, you know, I've, I've known a few bus drivers in my life, and I know that public transit uh, can sometimes be a thankless job. But I will say that as the father of a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old, uh, the five and the three year old are both boys that out, outside of firefighters, uh, bus drivers are maybe the coolest profession in the world to my two kids, or at least to the two boys. So uh, uh, know, know that there's an army of children who who love what you guys do and appreciate it. And certainly all of us on this committee do as well. Um, I, I, I want to uh, thank in particular, um, Miss Terry, uh, thank you for your service to the state of Ohio. I appreciate you being here. Hope you're enjoying Washington. Um, and you know, I just wanted to start maybe by asking a couple questions about public safety in 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 uh, in our transit system in Greater Cleveland. So, you know, first, maybe just a, a very basic question. You know, we obviously have uh, quite a bad fentanyl problem in Ohio. Uh, certainly, Cleveland has been no exception. Um, have your drivers been seeing that? Have they been affected by it? Are they are are, are they uh, responding to it, and and what do you think we could do better to better prepare them and better equip them to deal with it? Thank you very much for the question, and I also um, am in the fight with you for toddlers. I have a one and a two year old, a boy okay. and girl. So God bless you. I, I, you as well. <laughs> you, <laughs> um, to answer your question, and, and to really kind of segue into that, it's really important to be able to prepare. I think the next generation. Uh, for accessibility and making sure that we have a safe environment is absolutely important. So I take personal, um, you know, offense when things like what was mentioned happened last night. Sure. Um, we're doing a lot of things in Cleveland that I think can be replicated through the nation. Um, we are particularly working with the ATU on our side uh, to make sure that our union employees feel that they have a voice and that they have somewhere to to discuss. We also have an FOP, a Fraternal Order of Police, as we do have a uh, transit police force. Uh, we're slated for about 100 officers. We're currently down 23 positions, which is a testament to the workforce issue. Sure. Um, and also a canine unit. Not every agency, I realize, has that asset. 
Um, but with that, I think there's a lot of things that can happen in order to kind of combat some of the volatility. Um, fair evasion is a big issue uh, in every community. Sure. But making sure that we have that support by our legislation to make sure that we can actually process those issues are important. We actually have uh, started a civilian oversight committee, and we've done this in a space of positivity and proactivity. And that's really important, too, because a lot of these things happen after you have a tragedy. But making sure you have that transparency and additional oversight to be able to utilize the body cams we just put in is really important. I'd also say a transit ambassador program is something that can really be helpful. So that funding for workforce that we're asking for for the state budget and also through IIJA for flex funds uh, is really important because we have to make sure that those individuals have an outlet to make sure that when you have that mental health issue occur on your vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, which I was discussing with Mr. McMillan earlier, we, I believe, both agree that that's the crux of where that stems from. Um, and you see that exacerbated in urban areas like Baltimore and Cleveland, uh, that you want to make sure that we have a resource available. Uh, we've got our program up and running. We have 16 uh, professionals on that team, and six of them are social workers. And so they've got the experience, they've got the de-escalation training to be able to refer those individuals to housing programs, economic you know, programs, and mental health. But those are just some of the things that we can do. Sure. So I just one, one final question just about you know, maybe an expanded notion of public safety. And, and there isn't a right answer here. Uh, I'm just curious how, how you think about this as, as you lead this organization. Let me just explain briefly why I ask. You know, I, I come from a, a reasonably poor family. And one of the things that I, I take away from that experience is that I think kids you know, they know what they see and what becomes normal to them is what be they, they start to expect for themselves. And so, you know, if they see mom and dad go to work, if they see mom and dad have have a loving relationship, that mm -hmm. becomes normal to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they're riding the bus and they see people using drugs or people being uh, violent with one another, that becomes normal too. And that's obviously mm -hmm. a bad thing. I'm, I'm curious how you think, obviously we're focused when we talk about public safety for the drivers and the riders on violence, first of all, we want to make sure that it's safe in a very physical obvious sense. But how do you guys think about what's happening on the buses and whether, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've certainly heard reports in, a, in various communities that, you know, increasing rates of drug use on the on the buses. How, how do you guys think about that when you realize that a lot of your a lot of the people you're serving are kids and we don't want them to get the sense that that's the way the world is? Sure. I appreciate the question. Thank you. I think a lot of it actually starts with marketing. And I know that that's a softer side of how to approach some of this. Um, but the unfortunate part is that these are the anomalies that happen. They're, they shouldn't be the rule. And I think for everything bad that happens, we have a lot of good that occurs as well. And so we've taken a really um, uh, intuitive and I think intentional step in Cleveland to be able to make folks understand that we are a safe option for mobility. Um, whether you're talking about through COVID or whether you're talking about the violence, uh, we actually are starting to actually um, revamp our advertising guidelines and work through our advertising partners to make it more of a positive uh, messaging that gets out of there. To be able to have crisis communication programs for our all of our staff, really, and also work with the media to be able to highlight some of the great things that we're doing, it offsets some of those uh, one-off situations that really are horrible so that people don't think that that's the only thing we do. And then also with the kids, we have kid watch programs where we have IDs available for kids at major events. We have our transit police going out there so they understand that there's someone to talk to if something happens. We also have uh, human trafficking programs where we work with a lot of our sister agencies and social safety nets. And we've caught, uh, more than I want to admit, uh, situations where we are intervening on a good way and we're stopping that bad situation from happening. Might I also say that it's important to have that radio connection. Uh, I have an operations background as well and being able to communicate with a force bigger than your own is important. So being able to share radio channels with your city police uh, is absolutely imperative so you can increase your on-time performance when it comes to uh, getting there when something's happening. Good. Thank you all. Thank you. And uh, in the absence of the chair, I'm going to be the chair, and I'm going to recognize myself uh, so I can ask some questions. So I'm very glad that we're talking about transit today. I want to talk about bridges because bridges are a key part of transit and our broader transportation system. However, according to the Federal Highway Administration, nearly 69,000 highway bridges, that's more than one out of every 10 highway bridges in the whole country, are currently classified as structurally deficient. In Massachusetts, the Cape Cod bridges have needed repair for years and years and years. 
These bridges, which were built in 1935, are the only link between Cape Cod and the main line. There's no drive around here. They are the only link, and more than 35 million vehicles cross them each year. They serve as essential routes for general transportation, for tourism, and for evacuation in case of emergencies. The bridges are vital assets for the Cape Cod economy, but they are in desperate need of replacement. While the average age of an American bridge across the country is 42 years old, the Cape Cod bridges are 90 years old. Ms. Terry, as head of the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, you presided over the shutdown of your waterfront light rail line beginning back in 2020, and as I understand it, still ongoing, due to safety concerns related to a bridge on the route, namely stress fractures and stability issues. I want to ask you just to say a word about what was the impact on Cleveland citizens and the local economy of having to shut down transit routes because of bridge maintenance issues? So thank you for the question. Uh, you're absolutely correct. We've been working on our, water, our waterfront line bridge for quite some time now. Uh, we expect for it to open up uh, later in the year. Uh, we've got about a year to go. Uh, that particular bridge was not as old as the ones you mentioned. Uh, however, it was built in uh, 1996. And that being said is even more disconcerting because it's a younger bridge with particular safety issues that we found actually during an inspection, uh, which allowed us to be able to get ahead of some of the catastrophe that could have occurred. Right. But um, you shut it down. We did. Tell me a little bit about the impact of, sure. on the citizens of Cleveland. Absolutely. So that bridge uh, serves as a connection to a lot of our entertainment districts, our Cleveland Browns, if you're a football fan, mm -hmm. um, and also some of the science centers downtown, as well as the Flats neighborhood, which has a huge uh, economic driver for uh, residential as well as entertainment. Um, it was definitely an outcry from the community to say, are you sure you have to do this? Because it really kind of cuts away the mobility when we have major events. We've got to supplant some of that service with busing. Uh, and when you do that, it's definitely a little slower. It doesn't have the same capacity, and it also is a stress on our operation. Oh. Okay, so waiting until you have to shut a bridge down is a serious problem yes. in a city like Cleveland, and I'm going to guess out on the Cape as well. You know, I know that the Cleveland Transit Authority received federal funding to help improve the bridge infrastructure. Ms. Terry, how important was that federal investment to making your bridges safer and supporting your local economy? So the passage of the IIJA was imperative for us to be able to get that work done. We could not uh, do a lot of the remediation on our own. We had to be able to bring external crews. Uh, so that was imperative. And then also it allowed us to be able to keep the rest of our projects on time uh, so that we didn't have to kind of trade one project for another. Uh, and we also, also were able to use some of our 30% formula funding to be able to contribute to that project. Right. And, and let me just ask one last question here. Was this investment something that Cleveland could have done on its own using state and local funds? No, we could not have. Okay. That's the key point here. We need federal funds. You know, the Biden administration has made historic investments in our infrastructure, including through the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act. The Cape Cod bridges have yet to receive funding from the infrastructure bill, in part because the previous governor of Massachusetts failed to prioritize this issue and put together a competitive application. But I'm not going to stop fighting for federal funds for these critical assets. And that is why I am glad that in President Biden's budget, which was released last week, there's a significant $350 million down payment toward a $600 million commitment to replace the Cape Cod bridges and protect both the local economy out on the Cape and public safety. Our bridges should not be weak links in our transportation systems. And I am committed to making sure that that happens both in Massachusetts and all around the country. So thank you very much and thank you for your work. Thank you. Um, and now, Having taken over this gavel, I recognize Senator Britt. Thank you very much, Senator Warren. I'm going to start by leaning into some of what we heard at the very beginning of this hearing, stating the fact that our banking system remains strong, that the banks in the great state of Alabama are strong. SVB is a clear case of regulators refusing 
to do their job, despite the fact that all the signs, all the red flags were there. The Fed failed to use the tools in their toolbox to prevent what we saw last week. And I want to know why. I want answers. There are people in Alabama who are simply struggling to make ends meet, while SVP is getting a bailout from the Biden administration. Alabamians don't just want answers, they deserve answers. And I, for one, will not stop until we get them. I joined the ranking member in calling for a hearing, and I am hopeful that the chairman will do just that and will give us the opportunity to have the responsible party sit right in front of us and allow us to do our job. When it comes to the topic of the day, I want to start with thanking each and every one of you for being here and letting Mr. McMillan know that your driver, your operators, your entire transit family are in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you for your continued service and what you're doing each and every day to help make public transit the safest it can possibly be. Mr. Keel, I'm gonna start with you. When people think about public transit, most imagine a big, busy New York City and a subway to go along with that. Public transit in Alabama is very different. We rely on buses, especially in our rural areas. People use these buses to get to work, to buy groceries, to see the doctor, or to head to church. Mr. Keel, I am a huge fan of Greenville, South Carolina, and I believe it has a lot of similarities with communities all across the great state of Alabama. Just as in Greenville, transit operations in Alabama are tailored to the needs of the individual community or area. And I, for one, am a believer that local leaders know best. So based on your experience, do you believe that local communities should be able to make decisions regarding the transit needs of their unique community? In one word, absolutely. Uh, and I think that we, we demonstrate that mostly because we have a very tight-knit community. We have a lot of feedback from our county, from our, our, our local city government, um, and even from our, our, our legislative delegation that appoints members onto our board of directors. And, and because of that, um, and, and because of the great staff that we have, ultimately there are a lot of decisions that we do have the ability to make locally um, around some of the regulation that, that is provided to us. So based on those comments, I imagine you would agree local transit authorities, civic leaders are best suited to decide what type of buses they need, whether it be diesel, compressed natural gas, electric powered buses, um, because each and every community is different. I, I will say in Alabama, we have a problem with lack of range. So from Demopolis in our more rural area, when they come to the big city in Montgomery, they can't actually make that trip and get back without recharging. So it's frustrating that this administration has been pushing local communities to conform to the Green New Deal agenda and transit to green energy and green transit. Um, I don't have to tell you that there is also, in addition to things like lack of range, there's a cost component that is incredibly hard for some of our communities, particularly in our rural areas. So in your experience, is it realistic or cost effective to force communities to have a one size fits all policy when it comes to busing? I don't think so at all. Um, I think that the capital costs alone are something that smaller communities struggle with. Um, finding local match requirements um, for grants can be exceptionally difficult. And all of this is, you know, with the assumption that the utility in the area has the power to be able to support the, the demand on the grid. We're blessed in South Carolina that we, we really don't see those issues, but um, some of our more rural areas certainly do. Uh, and there are, quite frankly, some other opportunities out there that in the short term are better as this bleeding edge technology continues to develop. And let's lean into that. I only have a few few more seconds, but when it comes to natural disasters, unfortunately, um, Alabama is no stranger to them, whether it's hurricanes or tornadoes. In that same time period, um, the need to be able to um, have a vehicle that you can be used without charging is essential. I would, I would definitely agree with that. You know, um, the biggest kind of challenge that we face with a lot of the battery electric technology is that it, it works good as long as all conditions are normal, meaning that you have good weather, but you're not, you have had time to charge, you've had time to deploy. You know, in the event that you have a natural disaster that you need to be able to send a bus to or send it across the state to mm -hmm. help evacuate the low country of, of South Carolina, um, we also would not be able to deploy that battery electric fleet to do that. 
So having the flexibility to have other fuel sources, whether it's compressed natural gas, or we wait a few years and we have hydrogen technology, um, it's exceptionally important to be able to have that flexibility in our system. Thank you so much, Mr. Kiel. I am out of time, um, and I will submit my questions for the record for you all. Certainly want to know how we can make public um, transit safer and better for, for every rider. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Britton. You, you as witnesses don't know this, but uh, she is a freshman, and she has sat through these hearings more than anyone else, and I really appreciate that. So thank you for that, and asking, plus asking intelligent questions, uh, quite a combination. Uh, Senator Warner of Virginia is recognized. Are you presuming by that introduction that I'm not asking intelligent questions? Um, actually, I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, Ms. McMillan, um, let me join others who expressed their condolences about the, uh, your member, the bus driver in, in Baltimore, who I know you had to visit and Obviously, um, as we saw through COVID, um, the men and women who not only you represent, but who work across transit systems uh, didn't have an option of working at home during COVID and uh, appreciate very much their public service. I also want to pick up, though, I, I also want to acknowledge my new colleague from, Arizona, from Alabama. I, I would... Uh, maybe differ with her a bit in terms of the, the banking issue in that I think that um, candidly the ramifications of the businesses that particularly came out of tech were not just in California, they were all across the country and um, wouldn't have been able to meet payroll, they were depositors, this was not a case of, of um, bailing out the bank, the banks uh, who were responsible and the, the leadership and the, the regulators should be held accountable and I think basic prudential regulation um, should have and would have uh, been able to spot this. But one of the things, and I'm not going to ask the question of this, but I just want to re-raise it. I'm not, I'm not sure, um, I think we saw the first internet-driven bank run. I'm not sure what regulatory standards would have worked when you, you had $42 billion of capital leave in a single day driven over the internet by, frankly, by very some of the same VCs who subsequently were looking for, for support. And I say that as a former VC. Um, I'm not sure what the regulatory structure for that would be, but it, on a comparison basis, when, we, when Washington Mutual went down, it, there was a run, but it was 16 billion leaving the bank over a 10 day period. So there was a, some ability to prepare. The fact that you had 25 cents on every dollar being pulled on a single morning um, raises a, a a set of questions that I'm not sure we've thought through. And, um, but transit, and um, I'm very proud of being one of the bipartisan group that negotiated the infrastructure bill, $39 billion for transit, critically important. Hearing some of my other colleagues, uh, I gotta ask a local question first and then I'll get a general question. I'll ask you, you Ms. Birdsong Terry, um, one of the things that we're very concerned about in Virginia and for the whole DMV is um, uh, making sure we have another transit rail bridge across the Potomac. We have a bottleneck uh, that hurts um, Northern Virginia, but frankly hurts the whole region, uh, the commuters who, who go into Maryland as well as the district. So the Long Bridge uh, project is a choke point. Um, you have spoken, Ms. Birdsong Terry, about this need of interconnection between mm -hmm. light rail, heavy rail, other transit systems. Um, you may not know about the, the Long Bridge project, uh, but if you can you know, talk about getting rid of these choke points and again, how critical that bipartisan infrastructure funding would be uh, to that project, projects in, across uh, all of our communities. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, it's, it's absolutely imperative. We've got to be able to make sure as an industry that we uh, don't create our own hurdles. And I think that uh, the lack of capital investment in those particular bridges and other infrastructure that serve as a connector uh, is a problem. And in public transit, we have a very limited set of funds, as you're well aware, and it varies from state to state. And so you've got a local fight, you've got a state fight, and then you've got a federal uh, discussion at some points. Uh, as was mentioned by my colleagues, it's, it's a very, uh, you love when you get a grant, if I can say that, but you're never sure what you're going to get from year to year. Mm -hmm. And making sure that we have a, a leveling of the playing field through investments like IIJA are something that we have to have in order to survive. 
um, and making sure that we have those connections, I really think allow public transit to become real in certain areas that maybe don't have it or have limited. And then also those uh, economic vitality of the, of the system as well. We are a major player in making sure that people can actually get to work. So when you look at uh, things like sales tax and you look at uh, just the economics of any urban area or rural for that matter, um, public transit has to make sure that we have those connections. Otherwise, folks can't get to work, they can't get to hospitals, and uh, they really are, are dying in their homes, uh, to be quite quite honest. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I do think, you know, finally, in light of the infrastructure bill, you know, the feds are actually putting their money where their mouth is, and yes. this will be incumbent now on the states and localities. I'm going to ask very quickly, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, one last question, that for the panel. You know, uh, I, along with my Maryland colleagues and Senator Kane, are intimately involved in the challenges that Washington Metro faces. Uh, we have been very supportive in uh, finally getting our, our rail open to Dulles and beyond. Uh, but, you know, Metro is, Washington Metro is not unique in that they are still struggling with the challenge of getting ridership back, I'm sure, all of you have, have, are facing this. So how do we balance this notion of getting ridership back and potentially then uh, communities lowering fares, which may do, may help uh, on, on short-term incentives, but it also kind of puts further out of whack the overall financing. I just love top line from each of you on, maybe I'll start down here and I'll end up with you, Ms. Bertong Terry, Mr. McMillan. Yes, thank you. Um, well, this is part of what the ATU supports. We support that the FTA, this federal funding um, for capital projects, that it can be used for the operating budget. That way, when, as you mentioned earlier, the COVID, it slowed down the ridership. It's hard to bounce back from that. The funding, the federal funding that was brought in for that, it was greatly appreciated, it helped. But that funding is running out. So if we can use portion of this funding for operating costs, the service cuts will not have to happen. They'll be able to um, make retention with hiring bus operators to support the routes um, because more people um, have been working from home. Uh, our, what we depend on in Maryland uh, public transportation is the Fair Bus Recovery Act. So that includes the gas tax because people weren't going to work, that's down. Those in the shopping centers, the taxes from that, that was down because you know for almost two years, malls and stores were closed and a lot of um, other stores did not reopen. So we do support using um, that capital funding for the operating, to be able to be used for the operating budget. Mr. Keel. Good morning. Um, I, I would definitely say that we have a major capital problem really across all infrastructure in this company and co country and, and transit is, is no different. So um, the investments are certainly a good step forward. If we look at the number of applications that were received in both RAISE and um, the bus and bus facilities um, grants, we have a huge need that is still not met. So the investments are exceptionally important there. Um, you know, as, as we look at at fares and getting ridership back, I think that's a, a, a huge step forward. At the same time, I also think agencies are, are going to need to kind of do some um, some reflecting and, and some homework to make sure that we understand what the new normal is, meaning that a lot of these commuters that were riders pre-pandemic may never come back, and we may need to adjust our service delivery systems to adjust to what the current expectations are and prepare for what the new future is. And I think that we all have to do that, you know, independently and figure out what works in, in our communities. Um, as it relates to fares specifically for us, um, you, we have fare capping. Um, you know, you spend 50 bucks a month if you have a card or 25 if you're half fare. And we're looking at a basically a fare fee fare free program if you are a low income individual that qualifies. So we're really trying to make sure that we're not having any barriers to somebody getting back to work or being able to use our system to get to medical appointments or any other services they need. Last word. Thank you. I appreciate the question. Uh, in Ohio, we have a, a varied system. We've got upwards of 15 or 16 different agencies uh, throughout the state that provide transportation. So understanding what ridership means is, is really varied depending on who you talk to. Um, I do think that the availability of funds definitely helps uh, public transit, making sure that we're not focused on cuts and we're not in the scrambling mode every year, um, being able to allow us the ability to be innovative. I agree with my colleagues that I think it's on uh, us to be innovative and we've gotta make sure that we can figure out what the attractors are uh, beyond just the basic tenets of ridership. Um, so being able to think about 
um, flex funding is really important so that we don't have that burden. Uh, I would say that we also need to make sure that we have equity involved through fair capping and other mechanisms to make sure that people feel like they're involved in the process and that they also have a safe system to rely on. But I would definitely agree that the um, in inclusion of us in the, in the funding uh, kind of conundrum is really important because it allows us to make sure we make better business decisions and we don't have to focus on the volatility of the budget from year to year. Hey, Mr. Chairman, Thank I'm, you, Senator. I'm, I'm done, but I just want to say quickly that like three this, seconds, three seconds. This conundrum about how you balance fares versus accessibility is a, is a challenge. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Senator Moore. Uh, today's been an important opportunity for all of us on this committee to hear from the real experts in public transportation from different regions of the country people who work every day to deliver better service and provide safer service, and I know all three of you do. Um, I hope we can use today's hearings to continue this committee's history of working together on transit service. We can focus on implementation of the infrastructure law to, to help address safety and modernization and expansion. We can make sure the formula fi finds, the formula uh, finds that Mr. Keel described as lifeblood, a good word or more available and continue to modernize buses and trains. Uh, thank you again for senators who wish to, wish to submit questions. For the record, those questions are due one week from today, Thursday, March 23rd. To the witnesses, please submit your responses to questions for the record no more than 45 days from the time you receive them. With that, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you all.